Good evening to the Tabernacle Church in Metairie. Uh, what a great time we had uh, Sunday in the parking lot service. We'll probably have a few more of those as time goes on. But let me remind you of this Sunday. This Sunday we will be online for the Mother's Day message. And I want to let you know we have a special guest speaker. My wife and I just can't wait to hear from her. I'm expecting great things to, to see what God is going to do at our church in Metairie. I'm believing God is making a way for us, and uh, I believe God is going to be faithful, and he is going to allow us to reach people for the Lord Jesus Christ for one reason, one reason only, and that is to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. If we remain faithful to him, he will remain faithful to us. Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to continue in our discipleship teaching. Last week, uh, I taught on the eternal judgment, that we're all going to face judgment. And because of that judgment, it should prompt us to be faithful to the subject matter that I'm going to bring to you tonight. And that is the principles of prayer. If we know we're going to be judged, I believe we need to be in contact with God. We need to have a close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Our key verse tonight is found in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples to pray. Now, this is when Jesus gave them the essence of prayer. He gave them a model prayer. Jesus said, when you pray, say. Now, this, this model of a prayer is what has been known as the Lord's Prayer. And people recite this prayer. It's okay to recite it. It's not okay to recite it over and over and over again because Jesus was just telling them this is the essence of things you must say when you pray. So if we take what is called the Lord's Prayer and begin to speak on those subject matters, not repeating it word for word each time. See, Jesus, Jesus preached against re repetitive praying. In other words, pr praying prayers over and over, word by word, uh, the same way. Jesus said the pagans do that, and they think the more they say it, the more God is going to respond to them. But I want to let you know, God is our Father, and we are his children. We don't talk to God that way. So tonight, we're going to learn uh, the, the purpose of prayer, the power of prayer, the privilege of prayer, and the responsibility of prayer. Nothing is more important in a believer's life than building a strong relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father than to find a time of prayer and have prayer as a part of our Christian life. It'll bring power to us. It'll, it'll give us confidence. It'll give us hope in time of need. And let me tell you this, there's no amount of Bible reading, there's no amount of Christian service, there's no amount of church attendance, even though those things are necessary and valuable, there's nothing more valuable than us having a time with the Lord and a relationship with the Lord that we built through our personal prayer life. We need to look at prayer as a priority. Jesus attached great importance to prayer. In fact, Jesus is the model for us to follow in prayer. Jesus thought prayer was more important than food because he fasted a lot and he gave that time to praying to his heavenly father. Jesus counted prayer more important than sleep. Because there were times where Jesus was up all night praying. He wasn't sleeping, but he was praying. Then Jesus thought that prayer was more important 
than ministry itself because the Bible tells us he had to leave the crowds many times just to go find a place uh, of solitude where he could pray to the heavenly father. But more than that, Jesus is still praying. Jesus is interceding for believers right now. Even when we pray, he is praying for us. In Romans 8, 34, Paul says, who is he who condemns? Is it Christ who died? And furthermore is also risen? Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us? Jesus is making intercession prayer for us right now as we speak. He is, he is on our behalf to our Heavenly Father. So what is prayer? Well, prayer is simply talking with God. Now, it would, be, it would be foolish for us to have a conversation with a person and say the same thing over and over and over again. I don't think anybody will listen. I don't even think God listens to that. When we pray to God, we pray in a conversational manner. We pray with words as if he was right there present with us, which he is. When we get down to pray, God is opens up to our prayer and to our conversation with him. So prayer is simply talking with God. It's a two-way communication because you see, when we pray, God also speaks. God also answers. It's a two-way communication. It's conversation with God. It's not just about what we want or the petitions in our prayers, but it's about who he is. So prayer is not a religious ritual composed of, of, of made-up prayers or written prayers. No, when we get down to pray with God, we need to open our hearts to God. We need to have that, that fellowship with God, that quietness, that place where it's just us and God. So through prayer, you come to know God in a relationship that you can never have outside of finding that quiet time with God. The more times we spend with God in prayer, the more we know who he is and how he reveals himself to us. Prayer brings God's attention to us. The book of Acts chapter 10 at, at Cornelius' house. Cornelius was a Gentile who was not a Jew, but he believed in the God of the Jews. He believed in the, the real living God, the God who created heaven and earth. And he was a devout man. And he prayed to the Lord uh, constantly. God answered him. God sent him an angel that told him to go seek a man by the name of Peter to come to his house because Peter had something to say to him. Now, we know what that story is. Cornelius was a Gentile. He had his whole family there. The angel, because it was an answer to his prayer, came to, to Cornelius and told him to go look for Peter to bring him to his house because he had a message to tell him. Cornelius gathered his whole family together, and we know what happened. Peter preached the gospel to him. Peter preached Jesus Christ and him crucified to him. And as Peter was speaking, the Holy Spirit came down on his whole household. His whole household was saved. They were baptized. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began speaking in tongues, just like on the day of Pentecost. You see, God delights in our prayers. He loves to answer prayer. You believe that? You need to believe that. God likes to answer our prayer. Why? Because when he answers our prayer, he reveals himself to us in a mighty way. In John chapter 14, Jesus said this, verse 13, and whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. 
Man, what a promise that is, that we can pray. And God says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to answer your prayer. But the scriptures tells us that we need to pray continuously. The first time I read that scripture, I said, what, you mean I can't do anything during the day but to pray? No, that's not what it's saying. Paul, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. Now, we can't stay on our knees all day. We can't lay down all day and pray. What, what this is saying that we as believers need to have our minds stayed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Every day, during the day, our mind should be on the Lord Jesus Christ. There are times, look, there's all kind of prayers. And I've talked about that in a few minutes. There's all kind of prayers. We can sit down and we can just seek God and we can do things. We can, we can intercede. We can ask God. We can, we can do all kind of things. But during the day, I've heard that we can shoot up bullet prayers to God. Just a quick thing. Just, just say, God, can you help me in this situation that I'm in right now? Can you do that? God will answer you. That there are times where God has answered me in a split second to show me what I need to do in that particular time. Prayer has many facets, including the following. Number one is that waiting is a part of praying. In fact, uh, praying is really a, a time where we really can commune with God. Sometimes we just have to shut our mouths and listen to that still small voice. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, it says, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So, in prayer, a lot of times, we just need to wait. And I believe the Holy Spirit will show us those times where we just have to be quiet. And, and after we've made our petitions to the Lord, just to wait on the Lord. I've learned that many, many times. We need to wait on the Lord, especially when we're interceding or praying for, for another person or asking God for what we need is a part of prayer. How about waiting? Because sometimes God will speak that answer to you. The next thing is that we need to listen to God is a vital part of prayer. Remember that prayer is a conversation with God. We're going we're gonna to talk to God. We'll make our requests. We'll do those things. But then we need to have God to answer us. And God will do that. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Jesus said, my sheep, my people, you and I who have been born again have the spirit of God in us. We can hear God's voice. And many times we need to stop in, in our life and take a time to pray if you're ever going to hear God. And we're so busy in life that we don't ever stop. We will never hear God's voice. So that is uh, listening is a part. And then thanking God is, listen, uh, I, I love that part. Thanking God in prayer is very important. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, Paul says this, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In other words, we need to thank God constantly. But the one I like is, is Psalm chapter 100 verse 4. And it says this, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. I believe the first thing we need to do when we sit down to, to, to enter a time of prayer with God is start thanking him for everything. Don't start shouting all the things you need and all the pain you're in and the tribulation you're in and all your world is falling in on you. Why don't you just stop for a second and just enter his courts? If he's never done anything for you but to save your soul, that's enough to thank him for. But there's many other things we can be thanking God. I like to enter in and thanking God. 
I like to go to sleep at night thanking God for everything, for my life, for, for what he's done for me and all the blessings that he has given me. Let's enter his courts with thanksgiving in our heart before we start petitioning him for the things that we need. Uh, so uh, I think that is the way you need to do it. It's the way I do it. I, I feel better after thanking him for everything he's done before I start asking for the things I believe I need of him. There are three foundations that will build your confidence in prayer, and it's very important. Number one, the confidence that we're going to have in prayer is knowing God's character. We need to know who God is. And let me tell you how you know God's character. Well, the love of God that saved you. You know God is love. For God to save you, my goodness, we have to know that he cares for us and that he loves us. And the thing about that is that when we pray, every time we pray and God answers a prayer for us, and God has answered so many. God has answered, uh, 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 bless me with things that I didn't even pray for, things that I needed that he has given me. So as, as time goes on and we live for God and we see God's hand in our life, we understand his character. So when we sit down to pray, I know who God is. I know he loves me. I know he cares for me. And I know he wants to hear from me. The second thing is to know your position in God. As a child of God, we have confidence. God is not some, some, some far away uh, creature. God is our father. He has given us birth into this new life that we have. We are part of God's family. So if God is our father and we are his children and we are his child, I can feel free. I can feel confident to go to my father and ask him anything that I have need of. Knowing his character, knowing our position, we're in a family. My God, you, you should not feel bad to go to your earthly father and ask him anything. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, this is what Jesus says about going to our father and ask him anything. He says this in, in Matthew 7, 11. He says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Isn't that simple? If, if your earthly father, even though he's not, he might not even be a godly father. There are ungodly fathers that take care of their kids. But just think of your heavenly father, your holy father, who will answer you when you call. Then the third thing. So here we got, we got, we got to know the character of God. We got to know our position as a child of God. And then the third thing is the Holy Spirit. When you become born again of the spirit of the living God, God's spirit comes in you. So God's presence is already in us. When we go to pray, God's Holy Spirit will show himself that we are in the presence of God when we begin to pray. So that ought to give you some confidence there when we are praying that God's Holy Spirit in his presence is already there. My God, that's good, isn't it? Prayer has great power and uh, prayer enables us to cooperate with God. I love cooperating with God. I love the fact that God has me included in his business. That's each and every one of us, not just the pastors, not just the elders, not just the church leaders, but every one of us is in the Father's business. So when I love that because when I begin to pray, I feel that God enables us to be a part of his work on earth. We are all a part of the work that God has for us. The Holy Spirit is vital to effective, powerful prayer. The secret of praying effectively is to be led by God's Holy Spirit. And practice makes perfect. The more you pray, 
the more uh, you will be able to be effective in your prayer. And the Holy Spirit is the one who teaches us. A lot of times, I'll tell you to be honest with you, I get down to prayer, I don't even know what to pray for. But guess what? If we just sit there, the Holy Spirit will begin to bring things to your remembrance that you need to pray for. But intercessory prayer is a special type of prayer that releases power on behalf of other people. Many times we get down to pray and we're really not praying for ourselves. We're praying for loved ones. We're praying for our children. We pray for our parents. We pray for people that are dear to us, that they have need, or maybe they need salvation. So we intercede for them. And that's a part of intercessory prayer. In Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, God said this. God said, I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap between me and on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. God said there was no one interceding for the people. We as the people of God need to intercede for those who need help, those who are unsaved, those who don't know how to reach God themselves. We need to intercede for them. And I know there's many a people that, that, that are close to us that we need to be calling their names out before God in heaven that God might somehow make a way to invade their life where they can have eternal life as we enjoy. There are three levels of prayer when praying for other people. In other words, the intercession. Sometimes you pray with somebody. Now look at this. Sometimes uh, we need to join other people in intercessory prayer. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 19, he says, and again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. So sometimes we can join up with people, join up with two people, one person, y'all join together, join hands and, 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 and intercede for a certain cause or a certain person or a certain thing that God needs to, to intervene in. Sometimes we pray for someone when you, uh, uh, you initiate a certain person. Sometimes you can pray when we pray for someone, you're taking an initiative to say, God, I'm interceding for this person. It could be a loved one. It could be a wayward child who you're interceding for, that they're not turning their hearts to God. You can intercede for them. But sometimes we can pray against evil forces. This is when we intercede to pray for a type of prayer that will come when we know that the devil is at work in somebody's life or even in the church trying to destroy uh, the church. We can come and intercede for that. And, and our prayers are powerful and God hears them. And we tap into the heavenly realm. We tap into a realm uh, of the spirit where the evil uh, uh, actions are taking place. We can go right into spiritual warfare against uh, evil schemes against us. Now, there are hindrances to prayer. Prayer is not easy. Uh, there's many things that will try to keep you from being effective in your prayer life. Number one, and this is the greatest one of all, is unforgiveness. If you have unforgiveness in your heart, listen to me. Things got to happen there. This is what Jesus says in Mark chapter 11, verse 24. He says, therefore, I tell you, Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. Unforgiveness is a thing that will keep your prayers from being answered. Why would God want to answer your prayer when you have an unforgiving heart? When you're holding on against a brother or a sister or even anyone, God wants us to forgive. God wants us to be cleansed of our own sins 
So we can't hold anything against anybody. So unforgiveness, I'm telling you that if you have unforgiveness in your heart, you need to get rid of it. You need to forgive. Forgive as God has forgiven us and, and freely forgive others because God has freely forgiven you and I. And I want to tell you this, nobody's going to do anything to you that, that's worse than all the sin you've ever committed. God forgave us. Let us forgive those. So get cleansed before you go to God in prayer. The second thing that's a hindrance to prayer is unbelief. Now, you doubt, you lack faith. That's an ineffective prayer. We can't go to God doubting him. We can't go to God with doubt and unbelief. This is what James says. James says this. But when he acts, he must believe and not doubt because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea. Blown. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Blown and tossed by the wind. Look what he says. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. Faith. We got to go to God in faith. Why would we want to go and pray to God that we don't believe that he's going to hear us and we don't believe he's going to answer our prayer? We can't do that. See, everything in a Christian's life is based upon faith. Your salvation is by faith. Your healing is by faith. Your deliverance is by faith. Anything we get from God, we can only get it through faith. The book of Hebrews says this. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, without, without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And we should not even think that we will receive anything from God through doubt and unbelief. So when we come to God, we got to believe that he is. We got to believe that he hears us. We got to believe that he is uh, for our good and that he is for us and he's not against us. Another thing that hinders prayer is the wrong motives. See, motives, wrong motives will prevent our prayers from being answered. And, uh, in, in James chapter 4, verse 3, James says this, when you ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. In other words, if we are praying selfish prayers, it's ineffective. We, God wants to give us everything. But our prayers can't be for selfish motives all the time. God is always uh, uh, looks at the heart, but our heart is not right. And we praying prayers. God will not answer prayers, no matter how much you want him to, if our motives are wrong. Make sure that our motives are pure. Make sure our motives are according to the will of God and to the word of God. What are wrong motives in prayer? They could include many things, but basically praying in a self-seeking way, coming from a wrong attitude of our heart, and uh, or any kind of prayer that violates God's standards. Our prayer should be according, Jesus said, if you ask anything to my Father according to his will, he will do it. We have to make sure that our prayers are lined up with God's attitude and his word. Let me tell you about prayer. Unconfessed sin it will hinder our prayer. Why? Because unconfessed sin separates us from God. Remember, when we go in prayer, we want to communicate with God. Well, sin separates us from God. So before we get down to pray and seek God, we need to check our hearts and our life. Is there anything I need to repent of? Is there anything I need to confess to the Lord for? 
because unconfessed sin will keep us from receiving uh, our prayers of uh, being answered from God. Satan hates prayer. Satan hates and fears prayer. When we get on our knees and we pray, that is the most powerful tool against the enemy. I, I remember this, they had a sign in the gym we used to attend, and it talked about, he said, when the devil saw me down on my knees, he thought I was defeated until he heard me say amen. In other words, when we get down, we're not defeated, but we're powerful. Satan doesn't want me praying. Satan doesn't want us praying. Satan fears prayer because prayer releases the power of God in our life. In James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. See, prayer defeats the devil and, and because prayer gives us the authority to resist him. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you. If you're not full of prayer and full of the Holy Ghost and full of power, he won't resist you. But when we come against him, because we have power and authority, then he will move. In, in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, Jesus says, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and on the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means will hurt you. This is our relationship with God. When we believe what God has given us, when we stay close to God in prayer, in other words, let's not just go to God when we have when we're in trouble. Let's go to God for every aspect of our life. Prayer keeps us on guard against the devil. When you are consistently in prayer with God, you will be able to recognize every scheme of the enemy coming against you. Prayer is powerful. Now, there are three foundations, and I'm going to go over this quickly. There are three foundations that build confidence in prayer. Number one is God's character gives us confidence. Nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is impossible for God. His character in nature instill faith in us. And especially the more he answers our prayers and he has answered I kept multitudes of prayers for me. That's why I trust him. If he's answered my prayer in the past, he's going to answer it now. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God's character will give us confidence. Our position as a child of God gives us confidence. I'm a son. How do I know that? Because I've been born of God. I've been born of his spirit. I am in the family of God, and God is my father. The third thing is the Holy Spirit within us gives us confidence. He helps us in our weaknesses. He intercedes for us according to God's will. He enables us to pray in the Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, Paul says this, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. And always keep on praying for all the saints. Hallelujah. Prayer brings us in the presence of God. Gives us opportunity of being a part of what God wants to do on the earth. I thank God that I'm a part of a church that I can say, hey, I'm part of God's business in the world. I'm part of, part of God's will to do in this world. And I thank God for that. There are many different kinds of prayers. Man, we can, we can stay on our knees for times. We can stand. We can sit. We can pray as we're working on our jobs. We can, we can shoot up arrows to God. God will hear us every time on every. There's all kinds of prayers that we can pray. We need to pray all of them. Do all kinds of prayers. There's no one certain way to do that. 
Prayer is nothing but talking to God and communicating with God. So our confidence in prayer is, is founded on the faithfulness of God. God is faithful even when we're not faithful. God is faithful. Prayer is the substance of our Christian life. This is where we communicate with God for every need that we may have. Well, praise the Lord. I feel good. I hope that this teaching will encourage you to spend more time with God and to believe that when you get down and pray that God hears you and he promised he will answer us. God bless you. Keep praying for the church. Keep praying for our facility uh, that, that we're going to get it finished. And one day we will be worshiping and ministering to God and to the people in Mattery. God bless you. Don't forget Sunday morning, the Mother's Day message. And then I'll be back with you next Wednesday night. God bless you.